Hey, welcome back to Jesus Up Close, our study of the Gospel of John. I'm Pastor Kerry. This is Growing in the Gospel, and we're studying in this long-form teaching series, the Gospel of John, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Today, we're continuing through chapter 8. This is part 26 in this series, so if you'd like to catch the whole series, go to the playlist that's called Jesus Up Close on this channel. Today, John chapter 8, the title of the message is Liberating Jesus, how Jesus really brings us true freedom as we follow him. How can that be? We don't, we do lose ourselves to Jesus, but we find the freedom we've been looking for all of our lives. So let's dive into John chapter 8, Liberating Jesus. Journey with us verse by verse through John's Gospel. Well, I'm aware of the time, and so um, I'm, uh, the, the, the message today is a little truncated, but it's necessarily so because what we've done the last 20 minutes, I think, is really, really critical to what our call is, what our purpose is as a church. It's so vital that we take time to understand what God's doing around the world and to ask Him to enlarge our heart for it. By the way, one quick thing on, on the update with Josue. Uh, what, what is the, the land that they're going to build this building on was a, was a gift and the man that gave the land passed away. And so what happened is the transfer of the title deed to the church is kind of, it's gonna happen, but it's kind of snarled up in, in Mexican process, in Mexico with the government. So that's the delay. Um, otherwise, I think we would have seen pretty significant construction progress. But pray that uh, he's, there's an attorney representing the church, they're working through that process. It, it's moving forward as I understand it. I'll be down there later this month. Um, but looking forward to updating you as we go. But pray for Josue because they are breaking the walls out of where they are and they really need that building uh, to go forward. Well, I want you to open with me to John chapter eight. Are you, are you there? Are you ready? Uh, again, I'll be real mindful of time and because of that, we're gonna do a quick flyby and I'm gonna try to summarize the nucleus of this. I'm not gonna be able to break down every phrase like I wish I could. We began uh, John eight two or three weeks ago we came and began at verse 31 last week, so let me give you a quick backward snapshot. In the first part of the chapter, the, the leaders in Israel are trying to trap Jesus. He's in the temple grounds. It's at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, and they bring a woman caught in adultery, and they try to trap Jesus, violating Jewish law, which he doesn't. He ends up in the end of the story, uh, verse 12 or so, uh, saying to the woman, uh, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. So the context of the whole chapter is mercy. Jesus is God in a body on planet earth to extend his heart of mercy to the whole world. So all that week we talked about mercy. The last couple of weeks we then have been looking at the debate that ensued between Jesus and the religious leaders. Jesus, after verse 11, begins to teach and preach the gospel to the listeners there at the temple. But always, as always, his skeptics, his enemies, those that are trying to kill him and trap him, they're sitting there trying to dismantle everything he says, trying to discredit every line, and every comeback, they're questioning and debating him. Well, even though that's going on, verse 30 tells us, and I'm trying to find it here, these, as he spake these words, many believed on him. We left there two weeks ago saying that no matter the context, no matter how hostile the culture, someone always needs to hear the message of good news and hope, and there always might be a soft heart ready to receive, and in this case, there apparently were. But not all of this professed belief was true belief. And this is a very personal aspect of this. So in verse 31, and this is where we picked up last week, so your outline is partially filled in, partially not. Last week we expressed this, that first of all, Jesus in the first position, begins to expose partial or really fake belief. He's exposing unbelief that's pretending to believe. So verse 31, look at it just to review. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed or professed belief on him, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. Do you really believe what I'm saying? Is the essence of that. Because verse 32, Jesus is saying the truth. So when you receive what Jesus says, you know the truth. And what does truth do? It makes you free. It liberates you. That's why the title, Liberating Jesus. He is a liberator. When I'm listening and receiving lies and I'm in bondage to things that are not true, 
I'm in deep bondage, but when I come into relationship with God through Jesus, receive his truth, and when my posture is always receiving what God teaches me, uh, then always there's a liberating factor to it. It's making me free. It's, it's telling me what I need to know to flourish in this life, to be uh, like a fish in water, swimming in the environment, in the relationship I was created to swim in with my God. Well, in verses 33 and forward, they begin to refute him, which is why we say that it's unbelief masquerading as belief, because by verse 33, they're debating Jesus and they're correcting him. You can't say, hey, I believe you, and then the very next breath say, but you're wrong. Like those are contradictory statements. And that's what they do all the rest of the chapter. So at least the people that are refuting him are not really believers, even though they said they were, they're faking it. And everything they say to Jesus is a slur, and everything that he says to him is a truth claim offered in mercy and offered in grace. And so, as we did last week, what I want to do this week is pick up where we left off, which was the second thought in your outline. And that is Jesus exposes spiritual illegitimacy and offers true sonship. The debate in verse 30 has turned towards fatherhood. And they're slurring Jesus because the the rumors they've made up about him is that he was conceived through adultery and fornication, that Mary cheated on Joseph to conceive Jesus. So Jesus didn't really know who his dad is and, and grew up with a stepdad. That's their slander. And Jesus is coming back with truth and saying, no, I know who my father is and I know who your father is and they're not the same father. And so the whole debate there begins about fatherhood. And the big takeaway for us is, do I know who my father is spiritually speaking? that I can have a heavenly father, and if I don't have a heavenly father, then I'm I'm the child of Satan one way or another. It's only one of two categories. That's where we left off last week when Jesus looks at them and says in verse 44, you are of your father the devil. And that's literally where we landed last week. You guys remember that? Okay, so let's pick it up there. And I wanna press forward quickly because this builds to the end, and the end is where it was really Uh, It's all wonderful and powerful, but the end is where it really comes to a climax of practicality for us. So verse 44, Jesus said, you're of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. A lust is an unrestrained, overwhelming desire that's self-centered. A lust starts with a good desire that's then perverted and twisted and manipulated and leveraged and, and maybe elevated to the point of idolatry where it's driving my life. And one of the telltale signs of someone that is not following Jesus or that's not free in Christ is that he says, the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer uh, from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there was no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he's a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. So Jesus is very categorically dividing the group. He's saying, look, You either believe what I'm saying and you're in truth and living in truth and building your life around truth or you reject what I'm saying and you're you're the hostage of your own lusts and you're a hostage of of the lies of your culture and the darkness of, of your world. It's one of the two. And everybody in the room, by the way, is living in one of those two spaces uh, even right now. So Jesus begins in verse 46 to express his innocence and that they know he's innocent. Which of you convince us or convicts me of sin. They knew he was sinless. There wasn't a single person alive that could accuse him, credibly accuse him of sin. So he says, and if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He's confronting their willful rejection of truth. Why are they willfully rejecting truth? They're not only deceived, they're self-deceived. They're willfully deceived. They're, um, They're willfully unrepentant. They see the truth, they know it's true, but they don't want it to be true. We can do this to ourselves, by the way. How many of you have ever had something going on in your teeth and you know you need to go to the dentist? But you're like, nah. And you just, you lie to yourself. It's gonna get better. Does it ever get better? No. <laughs> if you say yes, that's because it probably fell out. Um, <laughs> We can deceive ourselves 
against the truth, and that's what they're doing. They know he's speaking true words. Verse 47, he that is of God hears God's words. This is the third time Jesus keeps coming back to the litmus test. Is your heart inclined to believe God? Now, I don't, I don't wanna make this sound like you've gotta have this robust, 100% comprehensive faith uh, at the beginning of your salvation. Jesus said mustard seed faith, faith of a child. And remember the man that uh, Jesus uh, performed the miracle for, and he said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine. Oh, interesting. In contrast to a passage like this. So real belief doesn't imply that it's comprehensive in its understanding and it never has any doubt. Real belief starts small and grows, but it's true belief. It's not masquerading belief. It's not pretending to believe, just expressing with the mouth something that I know in my heart is uh, that I don't really believe. Okay, so, so Jesus is pressing into sonship versus illegitimacy. Verse 48, then answer the Jews unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil. Every time they come back at him, the slur increases. And this is really the, the, the worst slur that you could use in a first century Israel context. A Samaritan was a half-breed Jew that lived in the northern part of the country. They were social outcasts, totally reject. They were the lowest of the low. Uh, they were the scum of the earth in Jewish minds. They were highly, highly prejudiced against Samaritans. And to say, you're a Samaritan and you're a devil, they've already said you're illegitimate. You don't know who your dad is. Your mom was a fornicator. And now, you're, now they're sl slurring him racially. Uh, and it was truly first century hate speech. Jesus in love and in grace responds. Verse 49, what does he do? Not emotional, but truthful. I have not a devil. But I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. I wish I could camp on every one of these phrases. Jesus is saying, I'm not inventing this myself. I'm not just elevating myself. God, the true judge, is the one that sent me. Verse 51, verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. The word keep here literally means to guard. It means to take possession of and to guard it. It kind of falls into that word, the idea of receiving his words or truly believing his words. Out of it would flow obedience. Out of it would flow a desire to obey. But it's most fundamental level, what he's saying is grab a hold of this truth and hold it. Like receive it into yourself. It's the same thing that John's been sharing the whole gospel. As many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Jesus says, if you will take what he's saying, the truth of the gospel, and keep it, if you'll receive it, if you'll guard it, it will give you life and you will never see death. So we move forward in the, in the passage, I'm just gonna turn my page here real quick, to, to part three, verse 52. And here's where I wanna really spend a little time, the time we have remaining. Jesus exposes spiritual ignorance and offers intimacy with God. These guys are blind, they're willfully blind, they think they're well-educated, they think they're highly informed, they think they know God, but they know a distortion of God. They know a perversion of God. They know lies about God. So he's gonna break that down. He's gonna push through the ignorance and he's gonna offer something wonderful. It's gonna be authoritative and categorical, but it's gonna be wonderful. And that's why I use the phrase intimacy with God. Verse 52, then said the Jews unto him, now we know thou hast the devil. He just said, if you'll believe what I say, you'll never die. You'll have everlasting life, you'll live forever. So they come back at him, now we know you're, you're a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and yet thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, you'll never taste death. They're thinking physical death. Jews, first century Jews didn't have a real uh, understanding of life after death and what it would be or what it would entail. We know a lot more now because of, of the New Testament. But at the time, they're just thinking physical death. And again, they're spinning and diverting the conversation as much as they can. And they're coming back at this concept of Abraham and they're saying to Jesus, look at verse 53, are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? Abraham was the, the top of the mountain, the, the pinnacle of greatness to them. 
He's the father of their whole nation, and he's the one that God appeared to in covenant and revealed himself to. Are you saying you're greater than Abraham? He's dead. The prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself to be? This is, they keep coming back. Who are you? Who are you really? Who are you making yourself? They know who he's, that he's making himself out to be, but they keep asking him, who are you making yourself out to be? I, I would say this. They're chiding him to say it in a way that they can kill him for. They're, they're, they're come on, say it again. Say it again. You know, they, they want him to say it so overtly. They're trying to get the people riled up against him so that kind of, his breaking of the law, the blaspheming, the claiming to be God can then stir up the people to anger so then they'll be justified to take him to, to the authorities and have him executed. Remember, they don't have the authority to execute him. So verse 54, Jesus answered, I honor myself. If I honor myself, my honor's nothing. If I'm, if this is just, if I'm just a man and I'm just constructing this, this is all for naught. It is my Father that honoreth me. Remember the voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. God from heaven has validated me, is what Jesus is saying, of whom you say that he is your father, that he's your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I would be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and I keep his saying. Now here it is, critical verse, verse 56. You guys okay? Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now this is really important. Why the talk of Abraham, what, what's the history here, okay? So let me step back and talk to you about this thing we call the Bible, okay? It is a story, it's a narrative. A lot of people approach the Bible like it's a topical textbook or you know, like it's got recipes for a better life. There's a lot of good advice. There's a lot of uh, directives on how life works. But in its essence, this is God's story, his account of time and space. Okay? And, yeah, we're written into it. We're living in the, uh, in the last chapters of the book of Acts. Okay? The church is going forward and growing on planet Earth in this span of grace. But when you go from Genesis to Revelation and you step back at a 30,000 foot view and look at the whole arc of the narrative, and you need to, by the way, and I don't have time to do that in the next 10 minutes. But here's four chapters of, of, the, whole, of the whole story. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Can you say those words with me? Creation, fall, redemption, Restoration. So chapter one, creation. God made a perfect creation, an abundant creation with plenty and enough and perfect humanity and perfect climate and perfect environment and all of it was beautiful and wonderful. All of it was good. And he basically said, don't rebel against me because if you do, you'll bring death and sin and you'll die and we'll be separated and it will wreck everything. And what did man choose? Rebellion. Man chose to disobey God, dishonor God. Man chose autonomy. We're going to come back to that idea. Hold on to it. Man said, I don't want you to be God. I want to be God. I want to be like God. I want to be self-determining. I want to be self-sustaining. I want to be self-dependent. I want to be expressive, individualistic. I want control of me and my story. And uh, so we'll take this... Uh, creation and all of it, and we'll just take it ourselves, God, and you buzz off. And with that rebellion came sin and death, and the planet, the whole planet and the human race was plunged into what we call a fallen state or lost or dead to God spiritually. And so every sin, every crime, every oppression, every bit of, of, of uh, bad stuff on planet Earth, including things like hurricanes and natural disasters, all of it is the result of sin, the fall. Well, at the at the fall, now, God has total authority and total power. He could have wiped everything out and started over and come up with a new creation. He has a, a master plan, a grand plan, and, a, and an eternal, mysterious purpose, and we'll understand it more fully in, in eternity. But here's what I know that he did. He came to Adam and Eve at the fall, and he sacrificed an animal, and he taught them about mercy. He taught them that though they were dead, they could be redeemed. 
they could be brought back to life, they could be saved. And that it would require the sacrifice, the shedding of blood, and it would require a sacrifice to take the wrath and the judgment and justice that sin deserves so that mercy could be expressed. So Adam and Eve would have been the first to experience that, but then when you read the first 12 chapters of Genesis, it's all cosmic events. It's creation and the flood and, and, and a lot of big events. And then chapter 12 zooms in real close to a man named Abraham. And God comes to Abraham personally in chapter 12, chapter 15, chapter 17, chapter 18. And here's what he basically said. I'm gonna save the human race through your lineage. I'm gonna provide my mercy and my salvation through a human savior that's going to be born through your lineage. But how much of that did Abraham understand? How much of that did Moses understand? How much of that did Old Testament saints understand? Well, Galatians 3 tells us very specifically that the gospel was preached to Abraham. Jesus, when he says, Abraham saw my day and he saw it and was glad, I believe, as I'm standing here, and I believe the Bible validates this, that he didn't just believe God in some ethereal sense. I believe that God gave Abraham at least some Old Testament rudimentary understanding of gospel principles. The fact that God is perfect and I am not, and I'm separated from him, and it will require an intermediary sacrifice, a savior to come in mercy and forgive me and rescue me and bring me back to God. And if you think about all the stories that we write in our fiction, it's all about an ideal that is somehow lost and then a hero that sweeps in and saves the day and brings back a restoration. All of those stories are gospel images of God's ideal creation that was lost to sin, but then the hero Jesus coming, God himself coming to earth, coming to time and space, promised to Abraham, promised to Moses, promised and prophesied hundreds and hundreds of times in the Old Testament, and then fulfilled, he shows up, I am God, I am the sent one, I'm the one that Abraham saw and rejoiced over, and he's telling these people, we're at this epic moment of scripture right now where hundreds of years of promises and prophecy is now embodied the fulfillment and standing before them. And when they should have been exploding with joy and welcoming him with open arms, they are hating him and looking for a reason to pick up rocks to kill him. And so when he says, you don't know Abraham and you don't know your father or my father because Abraham understood this gospel. Abraham understood his sin and need for a savior and understood that God would have to come as a sacrifice. He said to Isaac, God will provide himself a lamb. And I don't have the time to unfold it, but I could take, if I had 30 more minutes, I could show you four or five different times where God personally conversed with Abraham and we don't have a record of the conversation. But I believe it was very similar to what we talk about every Sunday. <laughs> that one day he would come, one day he would sacrifice himself and rise again and make his grace and mercy available to anybody who would receive it. Because Jesus says, Abraham saw my day and was glad. Let me ask you this question. Have you seen the grace of Jesus offered to you and have you received it gladly? Because these, this crowd was not, but Abraham had. Now, let's press forward a little more quickly to the end. Verse 57. Then said the Jews unto him, now again, they missed it all. They should have said, teach us what Abraham saw. Teach us what we're not getting. Teach us what we're missing here. But they said, you're not even 50. You're not even 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? Verse 58, Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, absolutely, I say unto you, and here it is. This is the explosive moment of the chapter. Before Abraham was, I am. Hey, read that last phrase with me. Ready, begin. Before Abraham was, I am. And what did they do? Verse 59, they took up stones. Now immediately, they're so, they don't have the authority legally to do this, but 
judicially and, and in their system, they're so overcome with emotion, they immediately grab stones and they're ready to kill him. They're gonna break Roman law now to kill him. They're so incensed, they're so livid. They pick up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. Now let's come back to this phrase, what happens? This, this moment just goes nuclear and then Jesus is gone. I wanna see that on DVD. I mean, that's like, like a James Bond move or something, you know, he just boom, he's just out. They can't get him. So, but what does he say? Before Abraham was, I am. Now that phrase goes all the way back to God's interaction with Moses. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the family then goes to Egypt. They multiply, they become a nation of slaves in Egypt. God raises up a deliverer, Moses, Exodus 1, 2, 3. And God, some years into Moses' life, meets him on Mount Sinai in the desert. He's a shepherd. He's, he's failed. He's flawed. He's run. He's left his countrymen. And God says, go back to Egypt. Go to Pharaoh. Tell him to let my people go. So in a way, Moses is going to be a mediator, a deliverer, again, a, a kind of a foreshadowing of the deliverance that Jesus would one day bring. Moses is a stuttering, backwards, just kind of like, I'm the wrong guy for the job. And, how, and what authority, authority do I go talk to Pharaoh? And how do, what do I say? And God said, you tell him, I am that I am has sent you. I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent you. So when God tells Moses who he is, this is the name he gave himself. I am. Now this is not, this is, it's kind of a, a concept I need to help you wrap your brain around for a minute. But I want you to think about it with me. This is the name of God that we know as Yahweh or Jehovah. How many of you have ever heard the word Yahweh? Okay. So that's the, the accurate Hebrew pronunciation of it. Jehovah is sort of the English pronunciation of it, okay? It's four consonants in Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew doesn't have any vowels, and ancient Hebrew just has understood vowels. So it had vowels in it in pronunciation, but not in the word spelling itself. So it's just four letters. And this was the name of God. This was the name that God gave himself. And in saying, I am, I am that I am, here it is. It is the ultimate declaration of self-sufficiency. It's the ultimate declaration of self-existence. It is the ultimate self, uh, 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 an, uh, pronunciation of self-determination. It's an ultimate announcement of all authority and omnipresence, imminence. I am, I am always, I am unchanging, I am everywhere, I am self-existent, I am self-sufficient. I am self-determined, I am. This is huge. It was so sacred to the Jews, they wouldn't even say this. They wouldn't write it, okay? By the way, whenever you see in your Old Testament the, words, Lord, the word Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, it's this formal name of God. It's the name he gave himself. So Moses has a message to go back to Pharaoh and say, there is an existent one that has ultimate authority, ultimate existence. He's the source of everything. All life, all power, all truth, all light, all reality. He is the source of all of it. He is the one great I am. You guys with me? Pharaoh's response was no. Now listen, there's, there's a reason that this phrase I am incensed them. First of all, it's there is no clearer declaration where Jesus declared that he is God. By the way, he's, he's, there's seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. I am the, uh, light of the, I'm the bread of life, light of the world, door to the sheep, good shepherd, resurrection, way, truth, and life. I'm the true vine. Um, there's another time that Jesus says this, though, and you'll remember this. When he's arrested at the garden and they come to arrest him and, they, and, and they, they're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, they ask him, are you Jesus, he says, I am. What happens when he says, I am? 
they were driven back by the sheer force of the declaration. So remember, they knew this, this is God in, in a body, okay? So this phrase is the name of God. It's a declaration of, of his ultimate authority. It's a declaration of Jesus' identity, true identity, and proof that he was God. But there's two practical, really significant aspects to this as I close out, okay? The first is this. It's a declaration of absolute authority and determination and truth, ultimateness, ultimateness, which means when God says, I am, that means I am not for me, okay? But when Pharaoh says no to God, what is he saying? He's saying, you are not. I am my own I am. No, there's no one greater than me, God. I'm Pharaoh of the most powerful forces and nation on the planet. So I revoke your authority as I am, and I claim it for myself. I am my own I am. Now, I want you to think about this because this is the world we live in. This is the main reason that man today rejects God. It goes all the way back thousands of years to the fall. We don't want a God, we wanna be God. By saying we wanna be God, here's what I mean. I wanna, I wanna be self-dependent, I wanna be self-made, I wanna be self-directed, I wanna be self-sufficient, I want to be my own self. I wanna take possession of me, I want to own me, it's my life, I'll do it my way, uh, I, I brought the last verse of that poem, um, Invictus, from uh, William Ernest Henley. Matters not how straight the gate, how charged the, with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now this is woven deeply into all of us. We really don't want God's authority in our lives. But when God says I am, he's saying to me, I am not. Like, I'm talking about me. I don't have a right to self-determination. I don't have a right to my expressive individuality. I don't have a right to redesign God's creation. I don't have a right to, to, to redetermine my own psychological wiring or my own purpose tomorrow. I don't have a right to write my own story or my own script in life. I'm not self-sufficient. I'm not self-made. I don't self-determine. That's not how it's made. That's not how planet Earth was designed. That's not how, not, that's not how you're created or I'm created. We're designed to be submissive in relationship to the I am. He gives us our identity. He gives us our direction. He gives us our purpose and meaning and life. And it, like all of Jesus, I am life, I am light. If you come to me, you'll have a fountain of living water flowing. All of it kind of wraps up into the, I'm the I am. I am the source of everything. So this, on one hand, practically speaking, is a complete claim of absolute authority in our lives. This is the water you were created to swim in. And your life becomes fuller and, and uh, more meaningful and more purposeful the more you understand what it means to live under the direction of I am. And to release the drive that's in all of us to be our own I am. To self-determine, self-exist, self-depend, all of that. But to really release that to the authority of Jesus in our lives. So on one hand, the application is authoritative, which, which on, might be a little intimidating. You might not like what I'm saying right now because I'm saying God is the owner and has the rightful claim to your life and all that you are and all that you ever will be. But this is where the other side of this application gets really wonderful because the, the term I am also expresses intimate presence. Are you with me? It means he is with you. And when you know him and receive him, you don't merely come under the authority of a very cosmic, powerful, ultimate being that's cold and heartless and power trippy and egocentric. That's, that's, this isn't a Marvel movie. Okay, it's not, you know, 
the one who holds all the rings of power is, is not just this, mean, this, this horrible, dark being. No, his authority is one with his mercy and compassion and love. His loving kindness is good. And so when you self-determine and self-exist and self-identify and self-self-self and you become your own I am, you self-destruct. You self-deteriorate. You self, I mean, you put all the bad negative words there, all the negative connotations. You, you, you self-undo. But when you relinquish self into the hands of I am, who truly is all powerful and truth and love, he wraps you up in his arms as a shepherd and a savior and a friend and mercy, and he's with you. And suddenly, you not only, have, you not only lose the authority to self-identify, you lose the burden of self-sustaining. You lose the burden of self determination and trying to invent yourself and recreate yourself and you lose the loneliness of walking through life alone in the dark. You get the I am who walks with you, his presence, his comfort, his grace. So you lose a little, but you gain a lot. Like it's not even close. The, the smartest thing you do is relinquish your rights to yourself. Relinquish your right to, to say to God, I'm my own I am. And come under the love and grace and direction of the present I am. I don't know what you're facing this week. I don't know what you're going at this week, what's coming at you this week. But I, I hope you'll remember this. I am is with me. Yahweh. Jehovah, God, he's not just Lord of all, he's loving friend. So your problems, hey, you may, when, you, when you relinquish your rights to self-determination, you lose your self, uh, you, you lose your individualistic self-determination, your own rights, but you gain, you gain. All of a sudden, the, your problems aren't yours anymore. How many of you would love to just wake up tomorrow and go, these are not my problems? <laughs> well, look, if you're your own I am, they're your problems. Yeah, good luck with that. But the minute you say, wait a minute, I am is with me, and I'm his, and I accept his authority in my life, then they become his problems. And that's a good place to live. Now, I'll tell you, my problem I keep jumping back into the I am my own I am mode. Like, I, I, it's our default mechanism. I keep picking up the problems going, what am I gonna do about this? And God keeps saying, no, I'm with you. Relinquish, let it go. Be mine, be mine. So my, my challenge to you is don't be intimidated by the I am authority, I am power, I am uh, God of the universe. Be, be submitted to it because with that comes all the grace and the love and the goodness that your heart really longs for. Well, my friends, just the idea that Jesus offers me a kind of freedom that I can't find anywhere else, he offers to bring me into relationship, true sonship and intimacy with God the Father. And he is the only way. He is the only Savior. If you've never placed your faith or trust in him, I hope you will. I hope you'll do that right now. If you have questions about that, what is the gospel? There's a playlist on this channel called Done, What Most Religions Never Tell You. And in short uh, 10 segments, 10 or 12 segments, you'll hear and understand the full breadth of the gospel and the, the gift of God's grace that's made available to you by Jesus. I hope you've made that decision. If you have, I hope you'll rejoice in the liberty, the real spiritual liberty and vitality in life that Jesus brings to your life. The highest being in the universe calls you his child. What an awesome thought. Thanks for joining me for part 26 in our study of the Gospel of John. I'll see you in part 27.